Amen. Let's stand back up and we're going to sing number 363 for the message this afternoon. Number 363, Saved by the Blood. 363. Saved by the Blood of the Crucified One. Sing out verse number one. Saved by the blood of the crucified one, the ransom from sin and the new work begun. Sing praise to the Father and praise to the Son. Saved by the blood of the crucified one, the Lord is Amen. Well, it's been a good day so far, hasn't it? Praise the Lord for all that he's done. We have one more message this afternoon, and I'm so glad that Gary and Michelle Kastner are able to be back with us. Of course, they're back home on furlough reporting to their supporting churches right now, and uh, they've been on the road, and they will be on the road. I think Gary told me the other day when they leave here this afternoon after the services, they won't be back here till November again, and so... Uh, we're so glad that they could be back for this special weekend to celebrate with us. And brother, why don't you come and um, bring your wife with you as well, because it's all right. <laughs> this is a special year for the Kastners because they're celebrating 30 years with our church, and they came here, uh, well, in September it'll be 30.
we're thankful. And I, I said when Brother Anger came, what a privilege it is to have people who've been here a long time and a lot of sameness. Gary has a lot of memories of me when I was a kid. Because <laughs> he was my youth pastor for a while and uh, he saw me grow up. But I appreciate the fact that uh, he's continued on here and he's allowed me to be his pastor. And just appreciate he and Michelle in the work of the ministry. And uh, I'm thankful for their friendship. Amen. And I'm glad he's going to be able to preach, but one thing we need to do is set the timer. <laughs> okay, you got that, Dave? Oh, I am greatly humbled. I really am. Oh, I love this church, and uh, I'm proud of this church. I'm proud to be a member of this church. And I love my pastor. And I don't want to cause him any grief. And I've tried to support him in every way that I can as a missionary. And I know, hope, and with your prayers, by the grace of God, I can continue doing that in this church. What do you say after we've heard all of these great messages? No one set the timer, set the timer. <laughs> I do have some thoughts. I just want to come back uh, and share my connection how did I arrive at Lehigh Valley Baptist Church? I was saved in an independent Baptist church in Lebanon, Missouri while I was in the military. They support me today as a missionary and we just went back there for uh, a great celebration and time uh, at that church and they're continuing on the same ministry and I thank God for that. That was in March 19th of 1981. And when I shipped out, I went over to Hawaii and ended up there at Kaneohe Air Station. And I was discipled there by two men of Kolau Baptist Church who were faithful men. They were in the Marine Corps as well. And they discipled me and, and Tim's dad was my first pastor. And uh, I just got to call him the other day. It's his 87th birthday. Mm. And I wanted to thank him Amen. for being a faithful pastor. Amen. Because I was in that church, uh, I surrendered to, there at that church, I surrendered to preach, had a ministry to the military base, and I was able to bring Marines out to the church. Many of them got saved and surrendered their lives also to serve the Lord. And from there, uh, Pastor Anger told me a, a call to preach is a call to prepare. And started looking at places to go and some of the men that were there at that time uh, in, in the ministry, uh, Randy Plunkett was there and he... Uh, was over us as the military had the influence there and uh, traveled also in the military on two Westpac floats to Asia and Australia and all around and uh, met some missionaries and uh, Bob McLean was in uh, Singapore. I was, went to that church and God just began to put things together for me to surrender and go to Maranatha Baptist Bible College. I heard some good things about it, knew about Tim and 
some of the other members there going to Bible college there. And so that's what I did. I, I uh, got out in 1984, went to Bible college, and met some great men of God there. One, one of the experiences I had at Bible college, there was a change of leadership, a change of presidents, and uh, um, there was some conflict and change of doctrine. And, and so I was challenged. I, I got to know some of the professors there very closely. In fact, um, I lived with Dr. Weeks, a Baptist historian, for one year, taking care of him after he had his brain surgery. I became good friends with Dr. Tom Strauss and uh, got to understand doctrine of the church. Dr. Cedarholm was still there and he taught, he was handing out local church pamphlets, you know, the doctrine of the church and why the King James and then you'd hear different things, things are changing. So at that point I had to make some decisions in my life. I think I was faced with some challenges as an early Christ, uh, young Christian at the time, a young preacher. But God in his providence, God uh, knowing my heart. And in fact, uh, in the missions class, Dr. Strauss said, you know, uh, you can go to the mission field. Uh, you can go to a mission board and they're going to have more control over you. You can go to, through some kind of agency, a little less control and clearinghouse situation. Or you can go out from the Lord's church, the local church. Amen. And I heard that in Bible college and I read in my Bible, I said, well, that's what I want to do. I just believe the word of God. Amen. Amen. But the problem at the school was they would bring mission board representatives. That's all he would see. You know, there would, every once in a while you'd hear someone say, no, we, we want you to go through the church or we'll help the church send you out or something along that line. But it wasn't just go out of your church. 1987, I met uh, Michelle at Bible college. I won't tell all the stories. I let her tell all the stories. <laughs> but I was working in a church and uh, she came to the door and the first thing I did is put a vacuum cleaner in her hand. And uh, <laughs> I don't know why she still stayed with me, but she did, amen. <laughs> She's been pushing that vacuum, clean the vacuum cleaner ever since. <laughs> Oh, but, um, you know, there, she was a member. Now, listen, folks, you just can't make this up. She was a member of Mazan Baptist Church, Mazan, Illinois, and her pastor was Doug Hammett. And so, in time, I traveled down there to meet Pastor Hammett, Spent some time with them there. Met Ronnie and George and uh, I believe Rachel at that time. And so uh, we were able to get to know him. And, and our plans were to graduate and get married at Mazan Baptist Church. And at that time, of course, getting to know Pastor Hammond. And he was, uh, little did I know, God was going to move him out here. But let me just take another side of this story. In 1987, I was a preacher boy at Calvary Baptist Church of Lansdale under E. Robert Jordan. And so at that time, uh, I grew up in Easton, Pennsylvania. I, I, when I come home, I would visit First Baptist Church of Easton, mm -hmm. Joe Thompson. And even that church supported me $25 a month through Bible college. But I knew of Lehigh Valley Baptist Church. Pastor Tim Buck at that time came up to Maranatha with John Davis. Some of you may recall some of these men came up to uh, Maranatha and they would uh, preach up there. And I got to hear about Lehigh Valley Baptist Church and met some of the students up there and got to know some of the doctrine here, and I, I believed, you know, this church believed in local church. And so even apart from Pastor Doug Hammond, I knew Lehigh Valley Baptist Church. In fact, I even attended here when I was visiting my parents and coming back in the area from 1987 or sometimes maybe 86, 87, 88, 
come through here and visit. Uh, so in 1887, I was close by and had some fellowship with some of the men here and so on and so forth in the Preacher Boy program. And so I had a connection. I had a plan in my mind, in my heart. I was going to graduate from Maranatha Baptist Bible College, and I was planning on going to Calvary Baptist Theological Seminary to uh, continue my training and Master Divinity or, and so on and so forth. And that was my plan. That was in my heart. And then one day, Pastor Hammett drove up to Maranatha and he took us aside. He wanted to take us out for lunch. And, and he explained, you know, God called him to Lehigh Valley Baptist Church. And he said... Uh, you know, would you like to come out and work for us after you get married and Lord willing, you know, everything, you come out and be on staff and one day we'll send you to the mission field. Because I already shared my testimony with him in these visits. And one of the things that I shared with him, and I, 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 I've also shared this with you, but at that time I was saying, you know, I believe this, I believe this about going out of the church I said, but I don't know anyone that does that. And he said, brother, there's churches all over America that do that. Amen. And I was excited. I mean, this is God's will. And then when God led me to Lehigh Valley Baptist Church and, and uh, God was putting that, I was going to work. And, you know, I went to Bible college. I worked full time. I preached full time and studied full time. That's just what you did. And uh, I, uh, I was rejoicing. God answered my prayer. God found an ascending church, you know, and God, uh, we're, one day we'll be going to the mission field. And, uh, and then in chapel, E. Robert Jordan appeared. And he came and he called me out from the whole assembly, he wanted to meet with me after the services because he heard Doug Hammett was here and Lehigh Valley Baptist Church and I was planning on going to Lehigh Valley Baptist Church, and he confronted me. And he uh, said, "If you know, Doug Hammond, he believes this, this, and this. Well, the interesting thing is I, in my ignorance, I actually questioned Brother Hammond with an ordination statement that I got on, I had on file uh, just a couple weeks before that because I wanted to know what he believed. And he patiently answered me. Then, you know, patiently went, I asked him all these questions from an ordination statement. And he answered me about the doctrine of the Bible, the church, and what he believed. And, and so I knew exactly what Brother Hammett believed. And Dr. Jordan, oh, no, he believes only Baptists are going to heaven, and he's a Ruckmanite, and this, and this, and this. And I said, Dr. Jordan, he doesn't believe that. And right there, he said, he said, if you go to Lehigh Valley Baptist Church, you cannot come to sem uh, yeah, cemetery, I was going to say, seminary. <laughs> it buried some of my friends, brother. Yeah. It is a cemetery. And I just believed God. Amen. And I just trusted God and I said, well, I won't be going to pursue further education at Calvary Baptist Theological Amen. Seminary. And I came here by faith, Amen. believing God and met Brother Myers and his family and served with them. And he was a blessing to me and my family for many years. Met Jerry, Tim, so many great men. But I do want you to know, the reason I came to Lehigh Valley Baptist Church is because of its doctrine. The reason I came to Lehigh Valley Baptist Church is because it stand on the Word of God. It stand on the church and sound doctrine and it stand uh, on separation and it stand uh, on missions and evangelism on, on the gospel. Amen. And so 
we came in 1988 and, and just believed the Lord took as many Bible Institute courses as I could at that time and, and just tried to be faithful here in the church. And as someone, as Brother Nat mentioned, some uh, mentioned about meeting uh, Milton Martin in 1989, him and George Anderson came through here. I was already here as a member and God began to open up our eyes to be able to go to BBTI and prepare as missionaries to get things that we needed to go to the mission field. And so the church sent us down there for, for a year in uh, 1991. And we were there 1990 into 91. And then we were there uh, starting to do some debutation. And that's when God, through uh, Brother Milton Martin, through some missions conferences that we were attending, God directed us to Chile, to the Mapuche Indians. And, and so God was... Uh, just working in a, in a great way, directing our lives. But it was all through this church. It was all through what God had put together by his providence and by what God directed us through conviction, through doctrine to bring us to this church. And, and I, I want you to know today, the reason I stay in this church is because of its stand on doctrine. It's stand on the word of God. It's stand on the church. It's stand on separation. This is why we are still members of this church. Amen. Let's go to Matthew 16, 18. And let me share some thoughts. Uh, you have a handout and I don't believe I can cover that. But Kristen Nadaski will tell you, this is the condensed copy. <laughs> this is the expanded edition. And if any of you really are interested, I will send that to you because it's a burden that I carry. And I'm sure many preachers in this room carry this burden. And I want to share with you today that this church is a great church. I want, you to, I want to share with you today that this church is a unique church. I want to share with you today that you are privileged in this church. Amen. Brethren, we have traveled in over more than 300 churches around America, uh, independent fundamental Baptists, uh, some of them of different camps and so on and so forth. And I want you to know that by experience and by going to different churches, we have a great privilege. We have a great honor to be in this church. Amen. And I know it's hard for you to get that perspective, those of you that don't know what's going on out there. But let me just tell you a few things that are going on. Pastors are dying. And there's no one to take that church. There's no one there to step up. That church is literally dying with pa the pastor, and I'm talking about dozens of churches all over America. I don't even have the full picture. But there's churches dying everywhere. Baptist churches. There's churches that are changing. Brethren, they're changing the Bible they use, the Bible they preach out. They're changing their, their, their stand on the church, their doctrine of the church. They're stay, changing their stand on music, on separation. And they're talking about you are legalists and we are full of grace. And they don't even understand what the Bible teaches about grace and about legalism. And it can happen quickly. Yes, sir. Yeah. One change of leadership. Two changes of leadership. And it's gone. Brethren, it'll never be the same. So I, I just want to take some time to try to make a connection with you to the past. We have a heritage. It goes back to Matthew 16, 18. It goes back to our Baptist forefathers who gave their lives, who shed their blood 
for this book and for the church. Do we understand that? That we have a wonderful her heritage. We have a privileged heritage. And because of, of what Jesus built and because of the faithful apostles of Jesus Christ and the, the pastors that were ordained after them and because of those churches throughout Asia, throughout Europe, throughout the world, northern Africa, because of those churches, brethren, we stand here today because of their faithfulness to give their lives, to lay down their lives for this truth. We stand here today. Listen, what we have was paid for. It was a high price. It cost them. Let us not forget what it cost them. Amen. Matthew 16, 18. And I say also unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Brethren, Jesus is the rock. Amen. <laughs> Jesus is the rock upon which the church is built. Amen. And listen, not only is he the foundation, he's the head. You know, one good thing we have to understand that independent Baptists, we are independent Baptists by conviction. And what does independent mean? It means that we have no ecclesiastical hierarchy. We are not controlled by a denomination. We are not controlled by an outside parachurch organization. Everything is done under the leadership of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit and God-filled men and ladies in this church making decisions for the glory of God. Amen. Jesus promises perpetuity to His church. And I want you to know that I really believe that you can trace our heritage and succession through history. I believe it can be done, and I'm not going to take the time to do it. I have some other handouts and so on and so forth that links this church all the way back to Jesus Christ, Church of Jerusalem, amen? And I believe it can be done, but I don't believe it's necessarily necessary to believe this truth by showing you through history. Let me just share with you that Jesus promised here, Jesus told us that he will build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He is speaking of the institution of the church and Jesus promised us that that church would perpetuate all the way to the end of the world. Now, what's at stake here? Go to Ephesians chapter 5. The very integrity of our Lord Jesus Christ is at stake. Is he able to do what he promised? We heard out of Ephesians so much about the church, and it, it does tell us in the chapter 1 and verse 18, he is the head of the body. 22, I'm sorry, he, he gave him to be the head over all things to the church. And we heard so much about the, the church there. But in chapter 5, I want you to see some verses about Jesus' relationship to the church. You know, to understand this passage, you have to understand verse 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Amen? So go back to verse 25. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, and that it should be holy and without blemish. 
Brethren, he loved the church. He loves the church. And he is going to present himself, Revelation chapter 19, at the marriage supper of the Lamb, he's going to present himself a glorious church. So from the time he built it to the marriage supper of the Lamb, there is a church of Jesus on this earth. Jesus said it. And he is able. Amen. He is able. Look at verse 29. For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. He loves this church. He nourishes this church. He cherishes this church. That, you know what I, listen folks, we heard about individuals. He is talking about you. It's talking about every member of this church. This is how Jesus feels about you. That he's a faithful husband. Amen. He will not fail. So this fact of a perpetual, unbroken continuation of biblical New Testament churches is established by Scripture. Amen. Not by history only, but by Scripture. Amen. By the authority of Jesus Christ. By the promise of Jesus Christ. It is guaranteed. Amen. But just as there is a trail of blood, we read, I hope, how many of you have read The Trail of Blood? Put your hands down. How many of you have not read The Trail of Blood? You need to read it. You need to read it. You need to read it. You need to understand the price that was paid. But just as there is a trail of blood, what I want to get across in the next few minutes, there's a trail of truth. There's a trail of truth. When you look back over history, whether it be the, uh, the different names of churches, as you see throughout history, we have the Montanists. This is uh, first and second centuries uh, going into Asia Minor, Italy, Southern Europe, British Isles, Northern Africa, Armenia, and other places. You have the Montanists. You have the uh, Novationist, you have the Donatist in Northern Africa, Novationist in Italy, you have the Paulicians in Armenia, and uh, brethren, we have to come to this understanding. What united them as churches was their doctrine. What united them was their faith in the Word of God, their practice of the Word of God. That is what made them uh, the church that would perpetuate from generation to generation all the way up till today. You have the valleys of the Piedmont at the foot of the Alps and uh, many were banished and driven from their native homelands by the Catholic state church and they, they sought safety in these valleys in northern Italy, southern France and other parts of Europe. And they became the Waldenses, the valley dwellers. And during this, the 5th to the 16th century, they were known from time to time as Cathari, meaning pure men, Albigenses for Albi, France, Petrines, Petrobrusians, Anabaptists for rebaptizers. And brethren, as we look at the truth, as we look at the truth that united them, is the same truth that we hold today. So when we look back, we could say, in essence, all of them were Baptist churches. And if we had to name them back then for a name, a modern name, they would be Baptist. Because they hold the same doctrines and truth. Let's look at some of those truths, if you will. 
There are 10 salient truths. I'm going to name them without going through the scriptures, but I'm wanting you, if you will, to take time to study the word of God. The church, Jesus' church. Remember, he says, I will build my church. So now we're referring it to as his church. How do you distinguish his church from the imposters? The Bible tells us uh, some scriptures about the book of Revelation, about the church of uh, Philadelphia. They kept his word. Brethren, they kept his word. How about the Thessalonians? How they received the word of God. And, and from them sounded out the word of God. They were faithful to the word of God. They were obedient to the word of God. And so that truth, that conviction to follow the word of God is really the principle upon which all of these other convictions are based. They followed the word of God with conviction. They believed the word of God. They had to, it was their only rule of faith and practice. And are you glad today in this church, this is the, our only rule of faith and practice. Amen. We follow the word of God. We believe the word of God. And brethren, we still believe it's the, the King James Bible. This is the preserved word of God in the English language. And we still hold to the word of God. And then we see they believe that his church was a local assembly of baptized believers. That's what they believe. These are the, the salient truths of all of these different churches. And they were called these names by the Catholics and by the reformers that were persecuting them. Did they all agree 100% on all these doctrines? No, did they all? But they believed in the word of God and they followed the word of God. They practiced scriptural baptism and for that, many of them died. You know, let us not take it lightly for what happens here. You know, I know we're behind, we're comfortable. You can get up here, you're among friends. You could read your testimony and, you know, no one's going to come in and stone you. No one's going to drag you out of this church and hang you. But let me tell you, 50 million martyrs, they were drug out and they were hanged and they were stoned. They were beaten to death. Women and children drugged through the stones to their death because of baptism. We have a great heritage. And so... They, uh, it was one of, uh, of baptizing only those who were saved. And the reason they were persecuted, brethren, is because they rejected baptisms of other imposter institutions such as the Catholic and Protestant churches. And so they had to uh, baptize those who came to them. That's why they were called Anabaptists. And so they believed in scriptural baptism. They believed in immersion. They believed in uh, the right can saved candidate by the right authority. Number four, they believed that the church is comprised only of a membership of regenerate people. So they, they required salvation before church membership. Number five, we've already said that the church under his church, under the headship of Christ only is autonomous on earth as a binding and loosing institution. Jesus gave authority to the church, Matthew 16 and Matthew 18. Number six, his church as an institution has been and will continue to be comprised of, per, of a perpetual succession of local churches on earth, never to perish or apostatize. Brethren, Jesus promised that this church, the church of Jesus Christ, will perpetuate until he comes. Amen? I'm so thankful for that. Number seven, his church maintains its own moral and doctrinal purity and separation from the world by the faithful and impartial application of biblical disciplinary measures at the local level. You can go through and understand that the churches practiced biblical discipline. 
Number eight, his church has never used physical persecution to coerce the conscience of any. Number nine, this church has never formed an alliance with the powers of the state. And number 10, this church has never had a centralized, hierarchical, or Episcopal form of government or a graduation, graduated tiered clergy. It is rather a theocracy executed through democratic processes at the local level through the Word of God. Brethren, we have, if you look at these 10 salient truths that united those churches throughout all history. These are the doctrines we hold to be true today. These are the Baptist distinctives that makes us different from the false churches. And we ought to be thankful. I want to take a few moments just to say how thankful I am for Pastor Doug Hammond. Because when I met him, I realized there's churches that truly send out missionaries. Churches that practice what the Bible teaches. And I'm thankful, Brother Chris, Brother Dave, and Brother Rod, and all the men that were able to share the first 10 years of the church. And, and I appreciated Tim Bach for, for the qualities he had when he was preaching the Word of God and practicing. But my life is here from the time that Doug Hammett became my pastor. Amen. And I'm thankful for a man of God that had convictions to stand on the doctrines we just talked about. Amen. And he didn't compromise, even when it cost him many things. He didn't compromise the Word of God. He didn't compromise the doctrines. And I'm thankful that he passed them down to me. And he passed them down to you, preacher, and you, missionary, Amen. deacons. We have Amen. a godly, goodly heritage. That's good. And I'm thankful for this church and for men. I can call my friend in the ministry. And young men that are coming up, that are taking a stand and doing the same things and preaching the same things and godly families that love the Lord and love this church. And you love the preachers. And you stand with the preachers and you stand with the doctrine and you stand on the word of God with the same firm conviction and the same desire to reach souls, Brother Ben, and to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Where did that vision come from, brother? We ought to be thankful for the men that God has placed in this pulpit. I was torn between two messages. That's probably most of these preachers probably had two or three messages like, what am I going to preach? Someone came over 15 minutes before one and says, hey, brother, you got a message? Hey, well, by the time I get to the auditorium, I'll know what I'm going to preach. Amen. Because <laughs> George was stepping all over it. Thanks, George. <laughs> I had another message, but I just want to share some thoughts it was Ephesians, uh, Revelation 2, 1 through 8. And I'm not going to preach that message, but the thought I want to bring out is this. The seven stars are in his hand. 
The pastors are in the hand of Jesus. And the other thing I want to share is Jesus is in the midst of the church. His presence is known right here. His power is known right here. And, and he, he keeps the man of God. He keeps his, this precious man of God in his hand. And he's doing that for us as a church so that we can continue the same old paths. And we, we will not remove the ancient landmarks. We will stand on the word of God. We'll stand on Baptist doctrine. We will stand on separation. And we're going to stand until Jesus comes. Amen. Let's stand with the men of God that paid a price. You know why? One of the things that really gets me, I love men like Dwayne Rutherford. I love men like Al Wells. I love men that supported me. They believed in me. They encouraged me in the ministry. Brother, they're gone. I can name so many more. These great men who delivered unto us the, 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 the faith that was delivered on, by the apostles, they, they guarded that for us and they preached that to us and they passed down these convictions to us. And brother, now it's all up to us to take that standard and be faithful till Jesus comes. Amen. And I'm thankful for your love and support of missionaries, your love and support of all the men of God that are sent out of this church. I just want to say I, I love you so much and I'm thankful for your love for me and, I, and my family. And I know you stand with us and you love us. You know where that love comes from? Jesus loved the church and he gave himself for it. And brethren, I know that you have my back. I know that you're standing with me. I know that I can count on you because you're filled with the presence of God. Amen. You're filled with the love of God and the love of Jesus and the fullness of God dwells in this place and it is known in our lives and manifest. And brethren, we want to display that in Botswana. And we want to reproduce this church in Botswana and wherever God leads us. We want true churches just like this church. And my prayer is for it, the pastors that stand in this pulpit, Brother Gable and Pastor Roland and Pastor Doug and all the men of God that stand here and God's raising up other young men in this church. I I. I hope and pray that you will understand there was a price paid from Jesus' time all the way to the day, even in the history of our church, but it goes beyond the history of our church. And let's thank God for that today. Amen. And let's renew our commitments today to this church, to the future of this church to keep the doctrines of this church pure, the ordinances of this church pure, the gospel of this church pure, the separation of this church holy. Brethren, doctrine makes a difference. Doctrine will provide direction. Doctrine will produce devotion. And brethren, doctrine precedes duty. Aren't you thankful for the doctrine we have? Aren't you thankful for the preaching? Aren't you thankful for the word of God? Aren't you thankful what God has given to us? Amen. Let's be faithful. Are you still in Revelation? I'm going to close with this thought. One of the 
thoughts that the Lord gave me this week was this. Hold fast. Hold fast. Look at chapter 2 in verse 25. You, can, you know the, the, the seven uh, letters to the seven churches of Asia. And, and brethren, uh, here's what I, uh, uh, the thought I had is that why only seven? Do you know there was 11 churches named in the Word of God from Asia? Why seven? Because if you study the seven letters, they are representative of churches of all times. That's why. Look at verse 25. But that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. Chapter 3. Verse 3, remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. Amen? Amen. Look at verse number 11. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast that no man take thy crown. Brethren, I'm here to say hold fast. Jesus is coming. Hold fast that which you receive. Hold fast that which we have and that we're doing for God. Let us grow in it. Let us hold it fast because we are going to get a crown when Jesus comes. God bless this church. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your support. I hate to preach and run, but I got to preach and run. And uh, the grass is growing too tall under the trailer, so I don't want the grass growing too tall under our feet. Amen? <laughs> Brethren, pray for us. Amen. We represent this church, and I take that very seriously. There is no way when I travel around the churches that I want to in any way bring reproach upon my Savior but I don't want to bring reproach upon Lehigh Valley Baptist Church or my pastor. And in my comportment and, and all that I do and say, I, I ask you to pray that we can honor and glorify the Lord as we travel in so many churches and we see so many things and we hear a lot of different things that burdens my heart, brings tears. We need the grace of God. Amen. We have a great church, but many churches are falling apart. Brethren, love this church. Support this church. Build up this church. It's a great treasure. From the Lord. Let us stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed. We're going to. Thank you. <clears throat> Father, as we bow before you today, we just want to say we love you, Lord. We thank you for Lehigh Valley Baptist Church. We thank you for all the servants that served here in this pulpit that are preaching the unsearchable riches of Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the faithful doctrine that you have delivered unto us and the men have been faithful to keep that doctrine. Even though there's a price to pay, Lord, we thank you for those who paid the price to take a stand. But Father, we, we thank you for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We thank you that the church is his. It's his design. It's his creation. And thank you for his promise to keep it. Lord, we ask you to give us great years ahead. Thank you for the vision that you've given our pastor and the leadership here. Thank you for those serving with that same vision for missions, for evangelism in the valley and missions all around the world. Father, we want to grow. Teach us, Lord, to grow. 
in this vision. Teach us, Lord, to grow in our faith. Father, we just ask you to move in this church in a powerful way and take us, Lord, uh, uh, to, to fuller growth and maturity in Christ. Lord, we, we are not satisfied. We want to grow. Father, we look back and we're thankful. But as we look ahead, Lord, we know there's so much more we can do for Christ. Bless us. Bless this church. Use us for the honor and glory of Jesus. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you, Pastor. Amen.